I love this sock. Yes. It just triggers. It triggers positive, positive memories, positive vibes. It does. Hey, Sean, it does. welcome back. Yes. Episode two of the new season. Here Off we go. to a bang. DFI podcast. Yes, We're back. Is. The market's up. What more could we ask for? I know, right? Market's up in a while the last week, though. Up, it has, down, up, it down, has. you know? Yeah. And it's nice because when you reconnect with old friends, they're like, oh, you're that crypto friend. Things are going good now, right? It's a legitimate <laughs> business. <laughs> yeah. 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 Everybody was like jealous and envious when the last all time high, then they were laughing at us at the bottom, and now they're jealous and envious again. And the cycle continues. <laughs> <laughs> cycle, cycle does continue. Well, you got some good topics on the uh, on the docket today. Should we start out with mm-hmm. this new ETF rumor? Yeah. So, um, Vanek, which is a a, a really big, um, uh, just a financial management company, right? Like, not it's not a crypto native company. They've been around for a while. But you know they have one percent of their assets under management in crypto and have a crypto crypto venture arm. Uh, made an announcement saying that like oh they believe that like you know ETH ETFs um, could be even bigger than uh, like Bitcoin ETFs and you know they're looking forward to having ETH ETFs. Um, and so you know that I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, I would love to see an ETH ETF, right? Um, but yeah, just I. I wanted to share it because I was like, you know, I think if the world starts moving money, like institutional money, you know, we see this with Bitcoin ETFs into crypto, this could, this could legitimize and make it mainstream investment for the community, like for the world, which then would make governments like a lot more, a lot less against it because they're seeing like, basically what's happened is Wall Street has capitulated. If you remember like the last, uh, the last bull market, you know, we had all these, you know, old Wall Street execs and teams saying that like Bitcoin and crypto are fake, they're frauds, it's not real money, that there's no val- underlying value to it, etc. And now what you're seeing is Wall Street is cap- capitulating, right? They've all agreed that like, you know, there's a market for this product, um, people want to invest in it. And, you know, crypto is a new technology, so it's not easy to invest for retail, though Robin, I will say, Robinhood has made it very easy to invest uh, in crypto, right? And, and so That's has Coinbase, right. but Coinbase is a, um, is a centralized exchange. And so, um, so, yeah, this is like the way that you can get institutional money into uh, a growing asset that people are interested in. So I wanted to hear what your thoughts were on this report of, of, of Vanek saying ETH ETF uh, and, and what you think the probability is of the ETH ETF actually comes online at some point this year or next year it's huge you know people were talking about it a lot at the ETH denver conference especially coming off the success of the bitcoin etf um you know it's interesting position for the sec because the sec has been trying to push back on any sort of legitimization of, of crypto they mm-hmm. have a bit of egg on their face after their way they handled the sam bankman freed issue and and some folks in congress would refer to this as you know crypto scams generally just in very broad terms, which there have been scams, especially with altcoins and certain centralized providers. But Ethereum is a very decentralized network. It's it's arguably not as decentralized as Bitcoin, but you know, there's no individual that could just bring down the uh, the Ethereum network. It'd be very difficult for someone to manipulate the price of ETF uh, of ETH of Ethereum. So there's a lot of legitimacy to having an ETF there. I think it's going to have to happen because. The debate, the argument that SEC would have to make in court to have approved Bitcoin, but to deny the Ethereum ETF is a very thin argument. And if you look at the scale, Bitcoin is like 1.8 trillion market cap. Ethereum's maybe half that. And then further down the line, you get to like XRP, Ripple, and that that space. Ripple's maybe a third of the point market cap of, of Ethereum. XRP has... Uh, won a case in court saying that it's not a security effectively recently. That was a big, big win this past year. So it's very, it's a very difficult sliding scale for the SEC to make that, to, to prevent it from happening in absence of congressional activity. Now, if Congress came in and they said, you've got to have decentralized network and this is what a centralized network look like, maybe they could do it then. But, you know, I think the SEC could definitely delay it, but it would be very difficult, I think, for them to stop it outright. What do you think? 
Yeah, that, I mean, that's interesting, right? I think, like, there's some there's some people who really don't want, like, I mean, Bloomberg itself doesn't think it's a high probability event, right? They're marking it as a 30% event, 30% probability that this happens this year, though. I don't really know where that 30% comes from. Like, what what is it, like, a number, you know, they pulled out, you know, uh, or is it, like, ba- based on some model, if it's a model, like, what's going into that? I don't know what the number is. I don't think it's likely, actually, this year. Um, but I think what could make it happen is basically it's an election year in the U S and so there's no, um, in an election year, like you see politicians and regulators act pretty responsibly in the sense that like, no one wants to really rock the boat, right? Like no one wants to create news, right? Uh, the Democrats don't want to create news that, you know, affects innovation or markets or, you know, make it look like, you know, the Republicans are more reasonable to like crypto. Right. So, you know, I think in the sense of that is actually that that would make me more hopeful that like if someone was able to propose a Ethereum ETF, um, then you know, it, it might get pushed through or, or, you know, there would be, it would be harder for the SEC. To be it's true. And they've got some big power behind them now with BlackRock and Fidelity having pushed, you know, a lot of success with that Bitcoin ETF. There's massive amount of capital of those now. And Venek, yes. I mean, the amount of fees they're generating off that is, is tremendous. It's, it's got to be a big boon for their business. So naturally, they're looking at, at, at Ethereum ETF and thinking, oh, well, of course, let's just keep mm-hmm. going, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you also called out in the article some interesting discussions about an ETF or an exchange traded fund stock instrument that could take advantage of staking and or restaking on Ethereum. Ethereum has these unique properties where you can basically lock it up and earn interest. Mm -hmm. I mean, so interesting point is like, you know, Wall Street has really been like the original DGENs, degenerate gamblers. Like that's that's what it's quantitative trading. I mean, you know, like with, with, with great math behind it. But there's there's it makes perfect sense that they would eventually go down this long tail of crypto and get more involved there's a lot more yeah. there there's a lot more opportunity it's faster markets it's more robust i think i think we could see it over time but uh that's that's going to be further down the road yeah and i i do agree with that i also interest interestingly vanak just slashed their price on um their bitcoin etf as in they're not charging the 0.2 percent um i think so it's it's free of uh, you know, whatever charge they call it um, until 2025 or it hits one point billion dollars under uh, assets under management. So whichever comes first uh, will be that will be st- when it's stopped being free. So if you want to, you know, if, if institutional money wants to invest, I, I'm sure everyone will respond and also make it free. Right. Like no, no one wants to pay 0.2 percent management fees on uh, on that. Um so that was pretty interesting. I will say on the, you know, the Congress not want legislative side, like we're seeing two senators, right, um, out of uh, two Democratic senators um, pressuring Gary Gensler not to improve any more crypto ETFs, right? Democrat senators, Jack Reed and LaFonza Butler, um, right? And they apparently don't want to see investors exposed to thinly traded markets with fraud and manipulation, but like I feel the fact that they are saying that kind of uh kind of shows that they don't really know how Bitcoin and Ethereum work. You're right. Yeah, no, you're you're right. It's a it's kind of a hollow scenario. It, it did just make me wonder a little bit who's funding those particular Congress folks. Like, do they get yeah. any amount of support from the banking lobby? I was just checking Jack Reed's page. It looks like he might be on the committee for banking, housing, and urban affairs. So there, there could be because there could be mixed incentives there. I think traditional finance may not always want crypto to be successful, so I, there's got to be some pushback uh, along the way. Um, there was there was an interesting comment recently. Uh, I don't know if you follow uh, Drake the rapper on Instagram. He reposted. <laughs> Did you see this? No, I didn't see it, but I do follow him. Uh, he he reposted a video from Michael Saylor, our favorite uh, Bitcoin uh, Phil mm-hmm. uh, Phil dude. Uh, basically talking about how uh, Bitcoin was going to eat the S and P 500, and so Michael Saylor was talking about how, like, over time, as, as Bitcoin becomes a preferred risk asset, it might potentially draw um, capital away from other risk assets, uh, which might have impact on financial institution or thing like that. So, follow Drake for financial that his his Instagram feed <laughs> is financial advice. 
I mean, you there know, you there are a lot of like non-crypto people who understood the power of Bitcoin um, a long time ago. So there's this NBA athlete, Spencer Dwinwiddie, um, and he signed a three year. This is in 2017 or 20. You know, it was a long time ago, but like the balls this guy had. So he signed like a basically a, I don't remember what the exact contract or terms are, basically like 50 million dollars in New Jersey Nets or something like that. This is, you know, again, this is a while ago. Um, I think this is his first contract. And his, in his entire contract, he wanted to be paid entirely in Bitcoin, right? And now this is when Bitcoin was, again, this is like pre-2017 bull market. Um, okay, so can you imagine that like, and first of all, I don't, you know, he's a he's an NBA athlete, right? You're not like a technical trader, but like he obviously saw something in Bitcoin or was willing to take risk or, you know, had a really good financial advisor. I'm not sure what, 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 um, what happened there but like can you imagine how what how much he's turned that 50 million into by being paid all in bitcoin at that time right that's that's amazing right and to take that kind of risk i mean i'm i'm, I'm so glad for him um that that it panned out because like it basically got other nba athletes and celebrities into crypto when they heard right that um uh that that he did this um you're right. That, that, that those are much less expensive Bitcoins, it's like five thousand dollar Bitcoin, ten thousand dollar Bitcoin back then. Super cheap. That's a lot of foresight to bring it in so early. Uh, but it's cool. I just, I just think it's a cool story. Yeah. In, in 2019, um, he converted his entire contract, three year, thirty five million dollar contract, into being paid in Bitcoin. So you know, wow, those are good returns. I don't think that. you get better yeah. returns than any other, yeah, financial instrument since then um cool there was some other big news in the last week we've seen um it's called is it called the den kun upgrade right uh for ethereum right um so it's a it, it's a combination of two upgrades right what, what are the two cancun and some, what was the other one that's right cancun and deneb deneb yeah i think deneb is another city in europe is that right probably uh sounds sounds like it okay that sounds about right or it's usually a bus stop somewhere in a european uh a european city but yeah right cancun and deneb also dencun rhymes with dankun which this was a proto dank sharding upgrade so there's like a bit of a <laughs> yeah. portmanteau there yeah so like w w walk walk through what happened right why the upgrade what what does it make better what does it make worse um but yeah walk us through the upgrade yeah, it's, it's a pretty substantial upgrade, both technically and also symbolically for Ethereum, because it enables what uh, what folks are calling these layer two solutions to really thrive on Ethereum. Since about 2020, the whole roadmap for Ethereum is not to be the everything chain for everyone. It's not going to be as fast as Solana. It's not going to be as inexpensive as Solana, but it's a very old chain. And in crypto, people pay a premium for an old chain because it's older, it's more secure, it's more stable. Uh, there's like a, 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 a phrase, the oldest chain wins effectively. So because Ethereum is seen as more secure, people will pay more to write information to the Ethereum blockchain, which is all well and good, except that many of these new applications need to write a lot of information. So since the past four years, there's been this roadmap to support layer two solutions building on Ethereum. And the way that those layer two solutions wrote their data back to Ethereum was in this uh, component called call data. Call data was a specific type of transaction. So basically, layer twos uh, were sort of like a, a an additional chain built on top of Ethereum. You could interact with them just like a normal chain. And, and every so often, those uh, results would be written back to layer one Ethereum. The problem was it was very expensive with the current design of Ethereum. And because it was so popular, like Arbitrum was spending millions of dollars a month writing data back to L to uh, Ethereum L1. Optimism, the same. Coinbase's base was doing the same. But they were doing it in an inefficient way, and that drove the cost up for everyone using Ethereum. So transaction costs were maybe $20 plus. Mm -hmm. Now they've in, uh, made a, a pretty substantial technical upgrade to Ethereum so those L2s can write to a specific type of data on the chain called blob data. Uh, which frees up the space for other people to write. It lowers a transaction cost for everyone. It's a great step forward in the uh, in the in the kind of the roadmap of Ethereum, and it it really sort of solidifies Ethereum's place in the crypto ecosystem. But what do you think? Do you think they should they should? Are you happy with the direction they're taking, or do you think they should have made different design decisions? I so I think the first thing is that um, 
the cost, uh, I think it's interesting. Oh, okay. One thing I think is really interesting is that Ethereum has basically decided to be like, um, like the future of um, crypto is doing transactions on L2 and not on Ethereum. And like, you know, all these L2s and L3s, uh, side chains, app chains, whatever, are going to be the ones doing interacting with the user. And then that uh, that's going to get rolled up to the Ethereum blockchain. So it's an interesting design decision because Solana has taken the exact opposite design decision where they are, you know, trying to maximize, um, you know, uh, TPS, maximize performance and not be like an L2 centric uh, like kind of technology. And I'm actually glad to see that Solana has not taken the Ethereum approach from a philosophical perspective, because now you can see two different, very strong blockchain networks you know and see what are like the pros and cons of each and how like as a developer or a builder depending on what type of user experience you want you can pick and choose and have different options right so in a way i think it's really good um uh like to to see this second i also think that i think ethereum is a lot older than solana and so you know there's a lot it's a lot longer chain there's a lot more it makes sense that, you know, they want to go toward more of this roll up and L2 centric route than, you know, what Solana wants to do, where they're really focused on distributed systems and performance. So I don't know if it's right or wrong, right? Like, I don't have the technical expertise to go through and decide if Vitalik's vision for Ethereum or Anatoly's vision for Solana makes sense or not, right? But I think from like a market perspective, it's good for us to have two different types of um uh, chains, right? So I don't think this is like, oh, ETH is better than Solana or Solana is better than ETH. It's it's good that we have these two different types of uh, networks and we can see like, you know, not who's going to win, but like what type of developers and what type of user experiences um, are good for both set of ecosystems. Um, so that's my first initial thought that like, I'm, I'm glad that we're kind of going in this direction. Um, but I, I don't know what you think. About you're right. That. You're right. It's it's kind of like a Darwinian evolution uh, situation. You know, it's very organic. Anyone can come up with any blockchain technology they want. Users can adopt it for for various purposes. I agree. It's nice to have options. Like if I were building a decentralized AI network, or if I were building a decentralized game system to keep track of things, and I need to write a lot of information to the blockchain, um, I may want low costs. And so you got a couple different options. You can choose where mm -hmm. your users are, where your capital base is. Mm -hmm. and we should see it play out over time. That is one nice thing about the crypto ecosystem is it does evolve on its own organically. And the, the, the products that have good product market fit succeed. The ones that don't, they die off. It's, mm -hmm. it's like a, it's a very robust ecosystem in that way. Yeah, agreed. And then second, you know, I think in general, the Dankun upgrade has been really cool to see for L2s, right? I think as you mentioned, uh, the average fee on base fell from a dollar fifty to three cents. Arbitrum declined from whatever they were to forty cents. Uh, sorry, they declined. Yeah, declined to forty cents. Optimism has uh, dropped, uh, you know, significantly as well from one dollar and forty cents to four cents. Right. So we're talking about massive drops in cost, which. If you think about what will happen, that means that DeFi companies and, you know, other any companies building on top of these layer twos now can take advantage of the layer twos and they're able to, you know, offset those costs uh, to the users. Right. So now the more users come in can come in because if I'm a user and I have to and I want to use Arbitrum or, or, or I have an app that uses Arbitrum and Optimism and I'm being charged a dollar and fifty per transaction. I'm like, dude, what? You know, like that's not cool. Like what the, you know, what the hell? So like, I, you're right. You're like, it, oh, it, now it it's like one cent, you can right? Do. Yeah. It limits what you can do. So I think, um, I think, you know, uh, uh, given that Ethereum has decided to take in this, like, you know, L2 centric approach, um, or roll up approach, it makes a lot of sense to have this because you don't want high transaction fees. Right. Um, and so I think, I think this is super cool. I think it's really helpful for the community as well. I agree. It'll open up a lot of good new use cases for everyone. Hopefully we'll be able to take advantage of it. And then there's also an, an additional class of solutions for those layer twos, like data availability solutions, IGDA, Celestia, which will even further reduce those costs for L2s. Mm -hmm. So you're getting to the point where it's it's almost you know less than a cent to do these transactions. And it's like, wow, maybe we could store more data on chain. We'll be less reliant on off chain traditional. And then once the it's less than a, you know, less than a cent, less 
you know, less than a tenth of a cent or a hundred of a cent, right? Using this technology, that's what technology is supposed to do. It's supposed to be deflationary. That's when builders are going to start building applications to change the financial plumbing system for everyday users, right? Like you, until transactions go up and costs come down, no, there, there's no business for consumers, because you have to be able to handle, you know, large amount of transactions per second. You need to be able to handle low cost, right? Customers are not going to pay just to, you know, move from one technology to another. The technology has to show like much better improvements, either through speed or through cost, but ideally through both, right? Um, and so, like, you know, now people can, for example, can start building companies like. Uh, credit cards, for example, credit and debit cards on crypto rails, right? To the user, it's still all USD, right? Through the customer, right? My parents can, they can still offer points to them. Everything looks the same, but the, the actual technology rails that the money is moved on and the financial rails, the money is moved on is completely different, right? And you really can't do that until, you know, you can increase the transactions per second and you can decrease the cost of something that businesses can build, um, you know, a consumer business around. It's so true. I think we'll see some of these layer two solutions get more involved in financial partnerships like Visa and MasterCard over time. People have assets on these layer twos and crypto networks. They naturally want to be able to spend them. There's going to be enough tipping point eventually where the two will start coming together. Yeah, I want to see someone create. a. I, it was one again, one of the three billion dollar ideas that we give out here. But when I was when we were uh, looking at different companies, one of the company ideas that I was looking at was like, you know, if there's a way to build a crypto credit card or a crypto credit wallet that uh, that can, you know, that can take down MasterCard and Visa. Um, they are an oligopoly. They increase fees for no reason on their merchants, right? Um, they're using the same technology that we've been seeing in since the, you know, I'd say the 2000s. Obviously, the you know, it's improved over time, but conceptually it's the same, right? So I want to see someone build a business that can, a consumer business, a credit card business um, that can uh, that can do some serious uh, market share damage to Mar MasterCard and Visa, uh, Discover and Discover and Amex. So uh, hopefully, you know, I, I don't think this necessarily, we needed this to stop that, to make that happen, but hopefully someone can figure that business out. A lot of, a lot of global opportunity. A lot of smart people are going to figure that mm -hmm. out. Well, let me ask you what about you this. Uh, what's that? Sorry, go ahead. I want to ask you about this, uh, this Coinbase article that you shared. Uh, I'm interested to hear this $1 billion bond sale that is, uh, raising capital, not through selling shares of, not through like selling treasury shares, but raising a billion dollars in convertible debt. Um, what do you think was the reason behind that? Why would, why would Coinbase be wanting to raise additional cash? Do you think they have plans to buy something or build something? Like they're going to get in the hardware space? Does that seem like a lot of money for them? I think it's a great idea actually. So my, like, I think Tesla did this also and people got upset, but like when markets are hot, and your price uh, of your stock is really, you know, let's say much larger or much higher than it was before, that's the best time to raise money, right? You want to raise money when, like, there is appetite in the market for people to do things like this, right? And obviously, you want to raise money where you take on the least amount of dilution, either, whether that's through a bond or a convertible note or through equity, right? So regardless what mechanism you use, you want to raise money when it's the cheapest for you to raise money, right? Like in, similarly in the, in the way when interest rates were zero, loans were like, you know, taking on debt was a good thing. And then knowing that like, you don't have to pay back those, pay back, uh, you know, that debt for a long time at, at a certain interest rate. And then you can use that money for expansion, use the profits generated from expansion to pay back the, pay back the debt, right? So um, in general, I think it's a very smart and strategic move by Coinbase to, um, to do that, right? To, they're doing a $1 billion bond sale. Um, that's very similar to uh, what um, Michael Saylor from MicroStrategy did, right? We, oh. Somehow he keeps, come, keeps coming back up. And so, um, so, so yeah, um, I think, you know, the, I don't know what, I don't know what they're going to use the uh, billion dollars for, right? I'm not sure that uh, they've made an announcement of what they're going to use the 
um, billion dollars for, but you could imagine they could use it to, if they have any other debt, they could pay that off. If there is, um, uh, if they want to, you know, buy more crypto companies and want to expand in this decentralized space, they can, if they want to put more resources toward base, right. And, uh, and you know figure that out they can so i think there's a lot of markets that they can you know get into if they want to do international expansion and you know grow the team internationally that there's money to do that um so i think it's i think it's like a really really cool uh you you know idea and, and use of uh use of funds well you're right i didn't realize this it looks like if i'm looking at their stock chart they had grown 270 percent since the last year in their stock valuation which is pretty substantial. Um, it's like a wait, two hundred seventy percent since when? Two hundred seventy percent since this time last year. Oh wow! To, uh, Google Finance. Yeah. Wow, it's that's substantial. Great. It's substantial. But the other hand is, are, are they calling a top of the market? Meaning, if you were the CFO of Coinbase and you're saying, okay, we're going to maximize the value we can get from this, do you look at it and say, well, we ran up so far? <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. So why why now, right? Um, uh, it's, it's so far to go to a million dollar Bitcoin price, right? Um, yeah, I think one is probably de-risking because you never know what the market is going to do. So it's like, it's probably difficult yeah. to um, be like, uh, like every investor always tells you like, don't time the market, right? So they probably yeah. looked at it and they're like, you know, there's never been a better time to do this. Let's, you know, you never know what happens, right? Um, and so let's do it now. So my guess is probably that. And, um, and you know, if the market goes up more, the market goes up, but the, the bonds on these are 2030, right? So there's, you know, if you look at it from a long-term perspective, uh, this is relative to, you know, what's been happening the last five years this is probably a good time to raise money. By the Fair way, Tesla enough. did the same thing, a similar thing. They didn't do it in a bond. They just did it in a straight dilution. But I think when Tesla stock price was near all time highs, you know, Elon Musk diluted the company to raise more money to, um, you know, to be able to fund like uh, building more factories and increasing production and things like that. Right. So I think this is like in general, a pretty, you know, common and well thought out strategy of, of, of uh, raising new capital. Well, speaking of which, I'm going to go check out the Cybertruck on Saturday. I got an invite as a early reservation holder yeah. to go look yeah. at it and sort of like basically put my financial like get get your finances get your get your mind right on this thing if you're going to drop <laughs> uh, the big cash, which I don't have by the way. <laughs> so, oh, that's what do you cool. think? What do you I, think about the Cybertruck? Would you pull the trigger? I uh, I mean, I don't need a big car. I live in a city, you know, so small car is good for us. Um, if I were to buy a Tesla, I think. You know, I would get a Model Y or Model X. I really like the I really like the Teslas, um, but I feel like Model Y and Model X, Model X is super cool. Um, but yeah, I also don't like the look of the Cybertruck. I think it's pretty ugly. <laughs> it's like, a bit I think crazy. All the, other, all the other Teslas are pretty good looking, and then you've got the Cybertruck. Uh, yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if that gets. It's like the new Hummer, the basically. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the new Hummer. It's a lot. It's yeah. a lot going on there. Um, yeah, well, you know, if it, uh, if it floods downtown San Francisco, you could always use it to Ford River, Ford Crossing, yeah, maybe. You know, get out exactly. Of the but it might be a bit uh, much for some of those small San Francisco parking lots. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Parking garages. I already have trouble fitting into a parking lot in my small car. Yeah, Can you imagine driving around in a cyber truck or trying to parallel park that in, uh, in the city? No. That's loud. That's loud. <laughs> Well, this is great, man. Should we wrap it up for today? Yeah, let's do it. All right. We'll play the music. Much fun, as always. Yeah. See you next time. <laughs>